Well, good evening. This is Camp Constitution Radio with your host, Hal Shirtliff. I am the uh, co-founder and director of Camp Constitution. And anyway, this is our premier show. And Camp Constitution runs a family camp, a week-long camp in at the Christian Retreat Center in Toa Nippi. And um, from July 12th to the 19th of 2015, uh, this would be our, I believe, our sixth year of summer camp program. In addition to that, we publish some books and other important reprints, Camp Constitution Press. You can find that on the website, campconstitution.net. Visit the bookstore. And uh, the camp program is an all-volunteer association and we rely on sponsors and donors, and uh, we have a sponsors page. If you're interested in helping keep this show on the air and also helping uh, by sending worthy people, both young and old, to our Great Camp program, consider being a sponsor. I do want to make reference to one of our sponsors, Socha Sign Company in Chicopee, Massachusetts, three generations of uh, patriotic sign makers, SochaSigns.com. Now, uh, today's episode, we'll be dealing with something called the Article 5 Convention under the U.S. Constitution, otherwise known as the CONCON. And my guest today is uh, Mr. Peter Boyce from South Jersey. Peter is a constitutional scholar. He is also an inventor. He spoke at Camp Constitution in 2014 on the subject of the Article 5, and he uh, hosts a constitutional study course for adults. And Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you, Hal. Well, Peter, I'm honored, I'm honored to be on your show. Now, Peter, you've been involved with this issue, the Article 5 issue, for probably 15 or so years. You've testified at hearings and so forth. Yeah, I, I began on this particular issue in 1993 when um, the bill was pending in the New Jersey legislature and uh, America was only two states away from triggering an Article 5 convention, we're fighting it in New Jersey. And, uh, now, uh, you also recently, I guess it was in 2014, in the summer or spring, you debated a lady from the Convention of States, which is on YouTube. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, she was and the I, uh, New Jersey director for Convention of States. I watched that debate, and you are quite the gentleman, but uh, you did a really good job of refuting the arguments. I especially liked how you made uh, you made an al- analogy between the Constitution being on the operating table, and then that you were you were the, the Constitution was the defendant and you were defending it uh, in the court. I thought it was a brilliant uh, strategy there. That's right. Um, well, okay. it kind of kind of uh, points out the seriousness of uh, what this venue is of triggering a convention. It's what it literally would do: would put the Constitution on the operating table, and the surgeons are those that uh, have no experience. The surgeons would be the delegates, and I, I say to people that uh, several years ago, uh, shortly after the birth of my daughter, who's now t- my 10-year-old daughter, my wife had a, a procedure that was somewhat serious. Anytime you put a knife to you and cut you open, it's serious. Mm-hmm. We knew, we met the surgeon, and then it was our, my wife's, um, uh, my wife's gynecologist plus the surgeon. We met that person. We looked at their credentials. We felt very comfortable knowing that were going on to this op- going into the operation that we had competent people. Now, with an Article Five convention, we have no idea who the delegates will be. Is that correct? No, no idea at all. No idea at all. Could, uh, they're, uh, they're push that it's going to be just citizens, no legislators. Uh, other groups push that it's going to be state legislators, but no federal legislators. But uh, the bottom line is it's it's an un, it's a complete unknown. So it's a little like going into an operation, and you ask, well, who, who, who's the surgeon's going to be? And I say, well, we're going to we're going to pick some from the general public. We're going to pick some from the state legislators. And uh, what in, what knowledge do they have on this issue? Well, they don't. They have you're, no so you're saying they right now there, that, there there is no there is no law or procedure currently. To select delegates to a this convent, to an Article Five convention, no. if they happen to have one. No, but I'll tell you what. There is actually there is a law. It's um, of the United States Constitution, Article One, Section Eight, Paragraph Twenty Two. The final paragraph uh, states, that with regards to, because Article One, Section Eight is that part of the Constitution that empowers the Congress. 
Well, uh, paragraph 22 uh, says that um, the Congress is empowered to, quote, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper to carry into execution the foregoing powers, meaning all those powers just listed in Article 1, Section 8, and all other powers right, delegated by, the, by this Constitution to the government of the United States. Well, the power under Article 5 to call a constitutional convention uh, at the time when 34 state legislatures have submitted their resolutions, uh, that's a power of Congress to call the convention. So if Congress has the power to call the convention, Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph 22 empowers them to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper to carry into execution that power. So Congress is going to make all the laws, all these assurances from those pushing for a convention saying that, oh, well, it's going to complete, completely in the hands of the states. They're going to make all the rules. They're going to set the agenda. Baloney. That's right Right in the first article of the Constitution. The Congress is going to make all those rules. So, so Congress, Congress is not going to give up its power easily. Now, uh, I know that uh, there's been several attempts by Congress to pass laws regarding an Article 5 in the early 70s and I think as late as 1979. I actually have the 1,300-page uh, uh, document that came out of the conference, the, the Senate, I think it was the Senate Judiciary Committee, chaired by Orrin Hatch, who was in favor of Article 5. It passed the Senate, what, the, several bills passed the Senate, but it was never, never went to the House. So there's actually, currently, there isn't any law, uh, but as you say, correct, you correctly point out that Congress will most likely make some laws if they, if they ever call one. Sure, sure. Congress has a vested interest in, in now, preserving let, let me, their, their powers. They're not, they're not let, me ask you, yeah. let me ask you this question. I know Judge Bork, the late Judge Robert Bork, wrote a letter to a Utah representative some years ago uh, back in the, I think it was early 90s. Right. And he said that a convention could easily disregard any laws that, are, that Congress makes or anything that any any restrictions that, are, that are, um, a resolution may be, a resolution calling for a convention from a particular state. For example, if it's the state of Massachusetts calling for a convention for the purpose of a balanced budget amendment, once that convention convenes, they don't have to worry about anything. They, it's, it's a complete slate. They can ignore any, any, any clause in that resolution that gave them some type of uh, thought to do a certain thing or limit it to one thing. That's right. With, with, that's right. There's a, there's a real. There's that's. Um, I, I'm. I'm guessing you're. You're referring to the. Um, I think it was the president of uh, Brigham Young University in Utah. I could be wrong. No, this was. A, this actually was a state rep. I think his name was Duncan Hunter, if I'm not mistaken, or Reese Hunter or something. Okay. And he simply wrote him. He got a hold of Bork. He, he called him on the phone, and then Bork sent a letter, which I guess would be used for other. He wanted something in writing. And Bork said that it is his opinion, and it's the opinion of many people that he believed of many other legal scholars. And by the way, um, Mark Levin, who is the uh, neoconservative talk show host who wrote a book called Liberty Amendments uh, last year in the summer of 2012, he regarded the late Robert Bork as the one of the, if not the greatest legal mind of his time. Mm -hmm. And I would probably agree with that. And I would say to Levin and his, his listeners that they probably should start listening to Bork because he was absolutely correct. So what Bork said is that Congress, whatever Congress may do, they may pass a law or a bunch of laws to govern the proceedings of a convention. The delegates may or may not adhere to those. They'd be unenforceable. What would they do? Are they going to send the police in to arrest them? You see? And... Mm -hmm. So, and whatever comes out of that convention, now one of the points that the folks who push in Article 5, first off, they'll say that uh, it's almost impossible for anything to go wrong. But if it does go wrong, nothing to worry about because all they can do is propose amendments. You still have to go to the states and you have to get, what, uh, three-fourths of the states to sign on uh, to these proposed amendments. And nobody would do anything crazy. Can you respond to that? Yes. Well, let me let me back up a little bit. I will respond to that if if I get off track, re, bring me back on. Uh, with regards to uh, Judge Bork, I've got a really clear quotation here in front of me from uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice Warney Berger, who responded to a letter from Phyllis Schlafly, uh, asking him, "Is it possible to limit a convention to a, to a single issue?" And this is his response. He says, "Quote." 
I have also repeatedly given my opinion that there is no effective way to limit or muzzle the actions of a constitutional convention. The convention could make its own rules and set its own agenda. Congress might try to limit the convention to one amendment or to one issue, but there is no way to assure that the convention would obey. After convention is convened, it will be too late to stop the convention if we don't like its agenda. The meeting in 1787, that's talking about our, our first constitutional convention when the Articles of Confederation went into uh, convention, simply to be, quote, revised and amended, and the delegates scrapped it all together and drafted a new document. Anyway, the meeting in 1787 ignored the limit placed by the Confederate Congress, quote, for the sole and express purpose, end quote. With George Washington as chairman, they were able to deliberate in total secrecy with no press coverage and no leaks. A constitutional convention today would be a free-for-all for special interest groups, television coverage, and press speculation. Our 1787 constitution was referred to by several of its authors as a miracle. Whatever gain might be hoped for from a new constitutional convention could not be worth the risks involved. A new convention could plunge our nation into constitutional confusion and confrontation at every turn with no assurance that focus would be on the subjects needing attention. I have discouraged the idea of a constitutional convention. I'm glad to see states rescinding their previous resolutions requesting a convention. In these bicentennial years, we should be celebrating its long life, not challenging its very existence. Whatever may need repair in our Constitution can be dealt with by specific amendments. End quote. So that's, and that uh, was the letter uh, that's available. Um, we can, in fact, anybody that contacts us, uh, visit our website, campconstitution.net, or you can even call me directly uh, at 857-498-1309, and I'll be happy to provide you with not just that letter, but all the other documents uh, that we mentioned on the show here. Most of this, these I put up on uh, uh, my Scribd page, uh, Camp Constitution Scribd page, or my personal Scribd page, so you can have this for yourselves. It's not something, and you could probably just go online and put in Berger's letter to Phyllis Schlafly. It's probably there somewhere on in cyberspace. But I believe I asked you um, yeah, yeah, earlier uh, back on track. Yeah, yeah, about the uh, that three-fourths, that, the, the safeguard okay. is that no, okay. no matter what sure. amendments may come out of this convention, and all they can do is propose amendments, correct? They, that's right. Right. they that's propose, they, yeah. propose amendments uh, and they're saying don't, there's, there's absolutely nothing to fear because it will come back to the states, and the states would never approve anything that would be detrimental to the, to the country. All right. Well, how well, would you answer answer that these, are the, these are the states that don't even obey their own constitutions. New Jersey's got a, um, what, half a tri- Half a trillion, quarter trillion, quarter trillion dollar debt and violation of its own New Jersey constitution. So these are the guys that are going to, they're, they're going to approve the new constitution. That's assuming that it even comes back to the legislatures. Here's the, well, here's that's the deal. Right. That, that's, yeah, here's, that's an important point. Yeah. yeah, but here's here's the deal: is that the only precedent is the Convention of 1787. Now the Articles of Confederation that went in to be revised and amended uh, required unanimous ratification by all the states. And the delegates not only decided not to revise and amend, but to scrap altogether, draft an entirely new document, but then even change the rules for ratification. Well, likewise, if our Constitution goes into convention, those delegates, once seated, they're vested with sovereignty. There's, there's no force on earth that can manipulate them or change, change how would you say, steer them. They're going to they're gonna, they're gonna do as they're going to do. And uh, including, they could change the rules for ratification. A good example is the new state's constitution that was drafted by the Ford Foundation that of course $25 million or 10 years and 40 drafts. Now the Ford Foundation isn't gonna just throw away $25 million on a whim. They knew what they're doing. And in that, the new state's constitution which they had drafted, the rules for ratification are that it goes to a public referendum, bypasses the state legislatures altogether. Now, do you think uh, – I know that some people would hear this and they'd probably think it's ridiculous that, that something like that would never happen. But I would suggest that maybe they won't adopt a new constitution, but they would amend this present one out of existence. They'd amend the heart uh, right, sure. Right. In other words, they may not – for example, uh, back in the 80s, uh, elements on the left – and by the way, it's important to point, it's important to point out that there are folks on both sides of the spectrum, the political ideological spectrum – that both support and oppose an Oracle fight for various re- different reasons. And I know back when I first got involved with fighting this in 88, 
there were some left wing groups. So I don't bump into too many of them at the state houses over the over the years, but there's been left wing groups. And we you quote Warren Berger. He of course was a a left wing um, Supreme Court justice. And I would say that you and I disagree with most of what he did. And he did a few things that was quite repugnant. Mm-hmm. For example, mm-hmm. supporting uh, Roe versus Wade. Right. But on this particular issue, he's correct. And uh, today we have groups that are a wolf pack, which is a George Soros pack entity, that's, pushing for an Article 5. That's the danger in New Jersey. In fact, yes, uh, uh, two days ago, was it one, Wednesday, three days ago, the uh, New Jersey Senate passed the, passed the bill. And now it's going to come up to the assembly. Uh, and that's the wolf pack bill. The wolf and pack. The, and, and, the, wolf and the wolf pack, pack is so it's from the left. Man. It's Democrats. Yes. So Democrats support it. Well, uh, one of the one of the criticisms that uh, those of us that oppose an Article Five is that uh, that this is a, a left. We've been deceived by the left. The left has always been uh, against one, and of course that's not true. In fact, the opposite is true, because if you look at the history of an Article Five, there've been over what 600 calls for an Article Five since the beginning of our Constitution. 17, I think New York State or Virginia were the first two to call for one. Back in the late 1890s, there's the so-called popular progressives. I hate to use the word progressive for right. people who advance socialism, which is retrogressive. But they were advocating the um, direct election of senators. And I believe they got almost uh, – there weren't 50 states in those days. There was a few less. So they mm-hmm. got the required – or close to it. And instead of having a convention, the amendment was, uh, was adopted, uh, passed by the House of Senate – and it went to the states for ratification, and it was ratified. And by the way, that sort of refutes the notion that states would not do anything stupid or foolish or radical. Mm-hmm. And in this in this amendment, right. Congress said the states won't, the state legislators won't hear it. We'll have ratifying committees because, as you mentioned earlier, that's one of the uh, possibilities. Congress can choose the mode of ratification, whether whatever comes out of an Article Five convention or a, a, an amendment that may be passed by the House and Senate in Congress. So I think that was the first time, if I'm not mistaken, was it the first time that this was passed? That it was um, it was a um, the states, the state ratifying convention com- conventions. It wasn't done by the state legislators. As I know, the one that um, was only been one that was ratified by the state ratifying one amendment. That may, you know, that may, I think that may have been. That's correct. That's you're correct. That's right. So, but here, states willingly surrendered the state governments. I should say, surrendered a very important power. They made the senators no longer responsible to the their the state state legislators because they were used to be chosen. They were elected by the state legislators. Now it's a general election, and of course the Sixteenth Amendment, which is the income tax, which is. the second plank of the Communist Manifesto, the states uh, embrace that too. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you would think 100 years ago that the average uh, legislator was a little bit more constitutional minded. Uh, and I would say, are we better off today than we were 100 years ago? Uh, you know, that's sort of a rhetorical question, but I think it could be answered with a, with a resounding no. If anything, it's a whole lot worse. You get back what you were saying earlier. You know, it's unknown who the delegates would be. You know, back then it was George Washington, James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. You know, these brilliant, uh, God-fearing. Well, men. you had uh, you had uh, was it Governor Morris of New Jersey? Uh huh. Yeah, I think he was uh, quite the brilliant man. I don't think I, I think uh, Jefferson was um, was in France at that time, though. I don't think he was a delegate. Jefferson but but you had Madison, who was known as the father of the Constitution. And I tell people how many, how many delegates would would share that same perspective as those founders? Yeah. Would it be a would it be a large majority? Would it be a tiny minority? Be and, a minority. It would yeah. be a minuscule minority in that they any more for the most part the legislators, assuming that the delegates were chosen from legislators rather than from the general public and assuming that legislators have a little. Uh, more knowledge than the general public. The legislators themselves don't have a, cu- a clue. They don't. In fact, most of them don't. No. And, and uh, I, when these bills came up, uh, when they're in the committee, in the Senate committee, de- deciding whether to release uh, the Wolfpack bill to the floor for a vote, and also in the Assembly committee, uh, making the decision to release the Wolfpack bill to the vote, bo- 
to the floor for a vote. I was the only, basically the only one there testifying against this venue of an Article 5 convention. There were there were a couple of others testifying that uh, overturning Citizens United is not a good idea, but I was the one specifically targeting the extreme danger of triggering an Article 5 convention. Uh, and there are maybe, and maybe 50 or so uh, college-age kids uh, on the Wolfpack side uh, pushing you know, for this thing to be passed. Well, anyway, after my testimony, which was all based on the Constitution and quotes from founders and so on, it was all solid. It wasn't, it wasn't just an emotional argument that I was making. It's all solid, factual stuff. Uh, in the end, in both cases, one of the legislators just had to speak up, and the gist of what they said was, oh, they, well, the uh, Constitution was drafted by these old white men that were slave owners and didn't give women the vote, and uh, uh, the slaves were considered only three-fifths human. Right. That's not the case. <clears throat> that's not. Oh, that's, that's true. Not the case. Oh, I know. The founders never, oh, yes. never considered slaves three fifths human. They knew damn well that they were totally human. The the issue of the three fifths came up because the the southern states, with regards to their representation in the Congress, they wanted all the slaves counted as full citizens to boost their number of representatives in the House. But when it came to taxation, apportionment of taxation, now they didn't want them counted at all. Right, and so the compromise was okay. We'll figure three fifths of them, but it wasn't that they were three fifths human. So these um, legislators, uh, I'm guessing they went to liberal universities or whatever. Well, this is what was put into their heads. This is what, they, and they don't look any deeper. They don't understand any deeper than that. They, you know, they know what they know, and that's all they want to know, and that's it. Well, and, Peter, uh, you know, I, I, there's there's this notion that the Constitution is obsolete, and this is a somewhat disturbingly widespread notion because it was written 200 plus years ago in an, an agrarian society of a population of about 3 million, it has to be uh, invalid today because we live in this global economy and so forth. And we've heard this before. And I, I explained to people that the constitution dealt more with human nature than it yes. did uh, anything else. And this notion of a global economy, we've always had a global economy. I mean, I mean, for goodness sakes, we were selling, uh, we were selling ice, uh, to, uh, to, China, to to India back in the 1850s, we had we had the Spanish gold, uh, Spanish silver coin, uh, that international currency that was a, that was used by many Americans before we had a mint, and and the idea of our constitution at the time of our constitution, every single state was a slave state. I think Massachusetts had made some, and New Hampshire made some inroads to slowly abolish it, but within within a short time. Half of those original states abolished slavery, and many of the new states that came in came in as free states. And the Constitution never said a state could not abolish slavery. Never right. said that. Right. States always had that prerogative. And slavery wasn't something that was unique to the United States. It was but, unique to a good portion of the world, including South America. So, what, um, so, the, the, so the idea – and I tell people this when they say, oh, you know, the Constitution, it's too old. I'll say, well, what amendments would you want to get rid of first? You know, the First Amendment? Yeah. Other, other than the 16th, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to get rid of two of them, too. So uh, <laughs> let, let me make – let's take a quick break here. Uh, not a, a, a real official break, but let me just mention uh, we are on WXME AM uh, radio in Monticello, Maine. And I want to uh, make reference to our – one of our sponsors that we're featuring tonight is uh, Socha Sign Company in Chicopee, Massachusetts. Uh, Bruce is the owner. It's a three-generation business. Bruce is a really good friend of mine, and he does incredible quality work. A lot of the banners and materials, the bumper stickers that uh, we can, are used by Camp Constitution are made by uh, Bruce. He does, uh, he, he'll do a, what they call a wrap on a vehicle, a trucks, trailer trucks, uh, even small signs. He does all kinds of great work. Go to his website, uh, uh, SochaSigns.com, and you'll see the great work they do. And if you're if you're listening to this in the Greater Monticello and Arista County, I always recommend go to your local person first. But if that local person isn't part of the Liberty Movement, then go ahead and support uh, Socha Sign Company. So let's get back to the show. We got about six minutes here left. Um, okay. Let me let me. Yeah, I was kind of. Collecting my thoughts as, as you were talking, we left off. You were saying about um, those that consider the Constitution obsolete. Uh, what it is that they consider obsolete is the uh, 
foundation upon which the Constitution is built, and that foundation is on the on the premise that there is a God and He gives us our rights, and that's why they're unalienable. And the Constitution then was built on that in order to secure those rights, and nothing more. So when it really comes down to it, it's it's uh, not an ideological battle so much as it is a spiritual battle. What they consider obsolete isn't the Constitution; it's God that that's the Constitution right. is founded upon. That's what they're really opposed to. They want to that's right themselves in the place of God and rewrite the Constitution in their own image. That's right. Uh, right now, Peter, where do we stand? I know that it's really difficult. To be, there was a report that came out in April of 2014 by the uh, Congressional Research uh, Group, and it's available online. And the, the author uh, seemed to play it straight. He didn't come across as he was in favor or against one. But the author mentioned that uh, Congress may or may not acknowledge any re resolution that's over seven years old. It may or may not recognize a resolution that is not uh, worded in the same way. So even if it's uh, calling for a certain thing, they may say, well, it's not worth We will we'll disregard this. Others claim that every single resolution is valid, even though many states have rescinded a lot of its calls over the last 10 or 15 years. I think about 13 or 14 states. Now, New Hampshire rescinded all of its calls in 2010, but got a new one in 2012. Right now, there are folks, and I'm involved in trying to repeal. We actually got a resolution to repeal this one call, and we have some success because the union leader uh, recently, um, in, uh, in mid-December, uh, came out uh, with a, with a um, editorial opposing Article 5, and some very key people in the state have come out against it. And we see that happening. I know about a year ago, it looked like uh, people were listening to Mark Levin, and then this group came out of nowhere, Convention of the States, and it looked like, boy, everybody was pushing it. Sean Hannity, uh, Rush Limbaugh, and, and uh, Glenn Beck, and boy, we, it was just this momentum. But I think the last six months to, uh, you know, the last six months or so, many people have been listening to people like you, Peter, and listening to other folks uh, articulate uh, uh, why new Amer the New American Magazine had some great articles. There's a group called Defend Not Amend, and many others that have been uh, just say, "Hey, take a close, take a look at the other the other side of this issue." And I think they're starting to do that. And I think the tide is somewhat turned on this. So I believe that there's probably about 23 states with live calls, but again, the Congress may not acknowledge these calls. So what uh, what is your take on that? Um, my take on is uh, a little. The truth blows a lot of lies right out of the water. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Mark Levin. I've got a quotation as part of my PowerPoint where Mark Levin is saying, and this is a direct quote. I've got it memorized. I've played it so many times. The Constitution has been rewritten, mangled, and amended by all three branches of the federal government, left and right. Well, it's an emotional argument, but it's an outright lie. The only branch that's ever uh, submitted uh, amendments has been the Congress. None have been by the executive branch. None have been by the judicial branch, and uh, all went to the normal amendment process. They didn't change the Constitution, not at all. Well, Peter, argument intended to impede people into supporting this this thing. And, uh, we have we have a minute left, so let's let's wrap that. First, I want to thank you for coming on, give a, giving us your time here. Anybody would like to contact you? How can they do that? They can Either email me at Delmont Sawmill at Comcast.net, D E L M O N T S A W M I L L, Delmont Sawmill, Comcast.net, or call me. Call my phone, 609 501 3351. 609 501 3351. Or contact Al and he'll give you my contact information. All right. And if you're interested, and in, if you wherever you may be in the United States, if you're interested in getting contact with people fighting this, uh, visit campconstitution.net, leave us a message or give us a call. Or if you're on Facebook, Stop the Constitutional Convention uh, is a Facebook page, uh, and you can go on that site and you can be put in touch with folks. So uh, I'm, Peter, I'm, happy to su I'm happy to support and help anybody I can that's trying to fight this thing. All right. Well, Peter, thank you very much, and uh, good, good night. Um, this is Hal Shirtliff, Camp Constitution Radio. God bless you. God bless you. Bye-bye.